I'm grateful to the organizing committee for inviting me to speak. I also want to thank Gary Goldstein for helping me strengthen the article on which this presentation is based. Now, last year marked the 400th anniversary of the first English translation of Giovanni Boccaccio's Decameron, a book set in Florence in 1348 during Europe's Black Death, the deadliest plague in human history. It may have killed three fourths of the population of Florence. So it is timely to take a fresh look at that influential but anonymous translation. First, let's recall that the year after Oxford's father died in 1562, and he began living with Sir William Cecil, London experienced an epidemic that killed as many as 25% of its inhabitants. Once again, in the years 1585 to 87, um, England suffered another outbreak of plague, which may have reminded Oxford of those earlier times. Just as today, while we try to survive the COVID-19 pandemic, we feel a special kinship with books about plagues and pandemics, Oxford would likely have had similar feelings about Boccaccio's collection of stories. Decameron was long controversial. Boccaccio was remembered to this day in the Italian word Boccaccesco, meaning licentious. Why was the book so controversial? For centuries, Boccaccio had been widely respected for his scholarly works in Latin and was regarded as a great moralist, advocating that obligations to one city and country be put above self-interest. Not a bad idea. Eventually, though, the salacious and fiercely anti-clerical content of Decameron overshadowed his earlier reputation. In fact, the book was entered into the Catholic Church's first Counter-Reformation Index of Banned Books in 1559. This made it a bestseller. In 1582, Leonardo do Salviati published a new Baudelaireized translation that returned to Cameron into the church's good graces through deleting its more offensive material. In Salviati's version, more than half of the 100 stories were significantly altered from Boccaccio's original text. One can imagine the tension between the fame of this book on the one hand and its power to offend the church with its relentless anti-clericalism. Although Boccaccio's Decameron was translated into several languages by 1500, its first full English translation only appeared anonymously in 1620. However, the printer John Wolfe entered a version of the book into the stationer's register in 1587. Converging evidence that I will be presenting leads me to infer this was the translation that was not published until 1620. Herbert Wright has shown that the Italian source text for the 1620 translation was Salviati's heavily censored Italian edition first published in 1582, which is consistent with the English translation then being registered five years later. The 1620 edition was published by Isaac Jaggard in two lavish folio volumes with dozens of woodcut illustrations. Further, it was dedicated to Philip Herbert, Earl of Montgomery, one of the two dedicatees of Shakespeare's first folio, published by Isaac Jaggard three years later in 1623. One theory is that the 1620 work was Jaggard's dry run for Shakespeare's first folio. Gaida Armstrong states that an anonymous translation was unusual by 1620. So a word about early modern anonymous publication. Marcy North, who has done seminal work on this topic, warns us that we suffer from some unscholarly prejudices about anonymous works. For example, quote, scholars have traditionally preferred works with known authors, and anonymous works are assumed to be far inferior to those of known authors. One cannot help but thinking of a parallel with the stigma of illegitimate birth. North concludes that scholars dislike an authorship vacuum and that once it is filled with a speculative attribution, scholars may move on without closely re-examining the accuracy of that initial authorship attribution. 
she cites the traditional attribution of the art of English poesy to George Putnam as an example. The history of the attribution of the 1620 Decameron translation to John Florio illustrates this problem. Herbert Wright, the first to make this tentative attribution in his fifth 1953 book, admitted he was uncertain. But in the years since, it is often treated as established fact, hanging onto the translation like barnacles. So we may meet resistance when we challenge such a possibly flawed but traditional authorship assumption. Herbert Wright deserves to be better known. Nearly two decades before his 1953 book attributing the 1620 translation to Florio, Wright published a book on early English versions of selected tales from Decameron. Wright was a scholar of profound erudition and deep familiarity with many of the early editions of Antoine Le Masson's French translation of the book, as well as with many early editions of Salviati's expurgated Italian translation. Armstrong observes that, quote, it was then typical practice to check the translated text against versions in different languages. Wright also inti was intimately familiar with Florio's 1603 translation of Montaigne's essays, so much so that one wonders about a possible role of confirmation bias as he developed his profile of salient characteristics of the anonymous 1620 translator. Douglas Bush is ambivalent about Wright's attribution of the translation to Florio, wondering if Wright developed his list of parallel characteristics in the anonymous translator and in Florio because he had already chosen Florio. If so, this would illustrate the cognitive hazard of confirmation bias when we unconsciously pay more attention to evidence that supports our pre-existing assumptions. Bush gives the example of Florio's translation of Montaigne being moralistic, but he does not find an equivalently moralistic strain in the Boccaccio translation. Armstrong writes that other scholars, quote, are skeptical about this attribution to Florio, claiming that there is insufficient evidence. Armstrong's comments on the 1620 translation weaken Wright's attribution of it to John Florio in several ways opening up the possibility of a different translator. Armstrong observes, quote, the 1620 edition is unusual among Boccaccio's works, works in English translation in that there is absolutely no indication of the identity of the translator. Boccaccio is not named on the title page or indeed anywhere in this book. There have been no other anonymous works attributed to Florio. The attribution to Florio, uh, quote, remains problematic. Armstrong also notes the paradox that Florio would have concealed his role in translating this book while he took credit for his highly regarded translation in Montaigne's essays. Melissa Walter concludes that Shakespeare could read Italian and speculates that, quote, Shakespeare could also have read the Cameron in French, possibly alongside Italian. That is precisely the two versions that scholars have concluded the anonymous translator of the 1620 edition used. Now, Oxford and Decameron in historical context. We know Decameron influenced some of the plays of Oxford. Wright speaks of, quote, the problem of Shakespeare's knowledge of Boccaccio, meaning how was he familiar with tales in Decameron that had not yet been translated into English and then used them in plays such as Symboli. I will present evidence that Oxford did the translation, which would highlight just how important Decameron was to him. Oxford's interest in Italy, in translations in general, in personally financing translations of works by Italian authors, Cardenas Comfort, the Book of the Courtier, and in literary translations are all consistent with his having undertaken this translation. Most notably, the translator's use of anonymity is fully consistent with Oxford's pattern of concealing his authorship of the vast majority of his works. The 1620 translation had difficulties with the legal authorities. The Bishop of London gave his approval for the book's publication only to be overruled by the Archbishop of Canterbury. Ultimately though, the book did find its way into print in 1620. The translation appeared in four further editions by 1684, attesting to its popularity. 
I think it is likely that whether or not he collaborated on the 1587 version of this translation, it was Anthony Munday who toned it down enough to overcome the objections of the Archbishop of Canterbury. Now, it may seem surprising that so many years elapsed between Oxford's translation of this work by 1587 and its publication some 33 years later. But recall that As You Like It, for example, was first entered into the Stationer's Register in 1600, yet was not published for 23 years. Of course, half the plays in the first folio were written by the time of Oxford's death in 1604, but remained unpublished until 1623. Decameron being published in 1620 by Jaggard with a dedication to Philip Herbert may be related to the circumstances that led the first folio to be published in 1623 by the same publisher and with Herbert and his noble brother as dedicatees. Herbert's wife was Oxford's daughter, Susan Beer, and she may well have been the owner of the manuscript of this translation. What else may have appealed to Oxford about translating this work? We know that Oxford devoted much of his life and his career to establishing English as a respected literary language at a time when few Europeans knew English. Given his interests, he knew that just as Dante and Petrarch made Italian as respectable as Latin for poetry, so Boccaccio did the same for Italian for works of prose. Ovid was one of Oxford's models for poetry. Boccaccio may have been such a model for literary prose. For Oxford, translations were an important means of making foreign texts widely accessible to English readers, honing his writing skills, and enriching the English language in the process. Oxford, of course, was a pivotal figure in the creation of English literature. A 2021 book titled How Literatures Begin, A Global History concludes that, quote, very strikingly, the beginnings of literatures are regularly venues for the transformative impact of interstitial figures, bilingual or trilingual intercultural actors who become the catalysts for new forms of cultural expression. These individuals are often able to import into the target culture their expertise in an outside literary tradition. Again, this helps us understand Oxford's interest in translating Latin classics, such as Ovid's Metamorphoses, as well as the Italian Decameron. Now, attributes of the translator. A review of Wright's 1953 book by Douglas Bush states, quote, the translator, like Elizabethan translators in general, and more than most of them, gave free reign to his own personal and stylistic idiosyncrasies. Further, in general, he is exuberantly, not to say intemperately, word conscious. Let me now list the characteristics White found in the anonymous translator, quote, in addition to his competence in both French and Italian, he manifests a special interest in dogs and horses, the sea, the law, drama, fine arts and music, a courtly relish for ceremony and rank. While many of these qualities do indeed describe Oxford, Bush does not agree with Wright that they describe Florio. It is instructive that Wright's methodology for identifying an unknown author resembles J. Thomas Looney's earlier method for identifying Oxford as Shakespeare. In fact, let's compare Wright's findings with Looney's relevant characteristics of the author of Shakespeare's works. So first Wright, and then I'll add in a different tone of voice, Looney. The translator, more than most Elizabethan translators, gave free reign to his own personal and stylistic idiosyncrasies, Looney. The author of Shakespeare's works was eccentric and mysterious, unconventional. Uh, right. In addition to his competence in both French and Italian, Looney, an enthusiast for Italy. Right. The translator manifests a special interest in dogs and horses, Looney, a follower of sport. Right. The sea, the law, drama, Looney, an enthusiast in the world of drama. Right. In fine arts and music, Looney, a lover of music. Right. A courtly relish for ceremony and rank, Looney a member of the higher aristocracy, and then the rest is right. He heightens emotional effects through vivid phrasing and dramatic particularity. The anonymous translator style reveals a concern for rhythm and balance for alliteration in a score of various forms, including doublets and triplets and compound adjectives 
and for repetition of words. I'll be returning to these stylistic characteristics later. Now, what of the anonymous dedicatory epistle to Oxford's son-in-law, the Earl of Montgomery? Oxford, of course, died in 1604. The dedication was most likely written by Oxford's literary secretary, Anthony Munday. The translation's dedication contains the phrase, foul mouthed slander and detraction, which also appears word for word in the dedication of Monday's signed 1618 work, Sidero Thriambos. Even the context is comparable. The 1620 anonymous dedication asserts that the book with Herbert as patron will, patron will quote, be safely shielded from foul mouthed slander and detraction. Similarly, Monday signed 1618, uh, dedication asks a patron to be, quote, protector from foul mouth slander and detraction. And these are the only two works in early English books online that contain that phrase. Monday also dedicated his 1618 translation of books three and four of the Modest of Gaul to the Earl of Montgomery with wording that, as Armstrong observes, is also similar to that of the 1620 translation. It is almost as though Monday used his 1620 anonymous dedication to leave deliberate clues as to his identity. It is conceivable that he collaborated with Oxford in writing the translation. It is said that, quote, in the 1580s and 1590s, particularly Monday functioned as a major translation factory, translating works into English from French, Italian and Spanish. But what was happening in Oxford's life from the early 1580s when he may have obtained the new Salviati translation until 1587 when a new edition of the book was entered into the stationer's register? A great deal. Highly relevant was Oxford's purchase of Fisher's Folly in 1580, which Mark Anderson has called, quote, a bohemian retreat for euphuist writers. Euphuism, which scholars acknowledge heavily influenced the style of the 1620 translation, was at its height in the 1580s, then fell out of favor. Oxford was banished from court for two years in 1581. In 1586, Queen Elizabeth granted him his 1,000 pound annuity. We might speculate that Oxford was attracted to Salviati's 1582 edition in part because being exiled from court himself made him identify with the 10 young people in Decameron who were in self-imposed exile from Florence as they recounted their hundred stories. So Oxford may have written the translation in the years following 1582, then decided against publication at the request of Queen Elizabeth, who may have found its racy stories too controversial. Oxford would have been more compliant with her wishes than previously, not wanting to jeopardize his generous annuity from the state. Now, linguistic parallels with Oxford Shakespeare. Wright did much to renew interest in the 1620 translation. He suggested that it led to increased appreciation of Decameron in England. Wright comments that this translation, in contrast with the Italian original, quote, is often marked by an emotional and a dramatic quality, as well as by a partiality for significant detail. This vividness is strengthened by a considerable range of stylistic effects from the simple and racy to the elaborate and ornate. The translator makes extensive use of balance and his work has a well-defined rhythm. These unite with a complicated and skillfully devised system of alliteration to leave a deep impression on the ear. Unlike Oxford, Florio wrote no dramas and Wright's praise sounds far more consistent with the writings of Shakespeare. Donatella Montini characterizes the translator style as euphuistic. However, as I've said, euphuism flourished during the 1580s, which adds to the evidence that this translation dates back to that decade rather than to the early 17th century. In addition, Oxford was known as the patron of the euphuistic school, further connecting him with this translation. Indeed, his secretary, John Lilly, initiated the euphuistic fashion with his 1579 novel, Euphuist, The Anatomy of Wit, and with his second novel in 1580, Euphuist and His England, both of which featured an Italianized Englishman. Moreover, Lilly dedicated his second Euphuist novel to Oxford. 
C.S. Lewis has characterized euphorism as, quote, antithesis, alliteration, balance, rhyme, and assonance, all taken to excess. Recall that Wright emphasized the alliteration and balance in the 1620 translation. Here is just one example of its alliteration. The quadruple alliteration of the letter F, followed by, in the same word, by the letter R in the phrase, free from future fear. Significantly, Montini cites a passage in the, anon in the anonymous 1589, Art of English Poesy, as she examines the translator's style. Previously, I've attributed the art to Oxford himself. Montini believes the 1620 translation makes heavy use of what the art calls, quote, the climbing figure of climax, a scheme that presents a mounting over a series of words, clauses, or sentences, close quote. Montini then concludes, the structured principle which shapes the 1620 translation is that of copia, abundance of increase, of crescendo. In various forms and at different levels, the translator develops a homogeneous pervasive strategy of addition and expansion. The translator's style presents the usual arsenal of devices typical of euphuism. Equally important is that Oxford extensively used hendiadis, a particular kind of verbal doublet, more than any other Elizabethan writer. Montini extensively explores the translation's use of such doublets. She also links alliteration with such doubling in many cases. She speaks of the translator's, quote, love for alliterations to couple two terms different in meaning and similar in form. I will now note a few parallels with Oxford's other works and word coinages, quirky spellings, and phrases that are also found in Shakespeare. The 1620 translation uses the trope, quote, his hair stood upright like porcupine's quill. You remember when the ghost in Hamlet says, I could a tale unfold whose lightest word would harrow up thy soul and make each particular hair to stand on end like quills upon the fretful porcupine. What an image of fright. The OED gives this 1620 translation as the source of five newly coined words, hard aching, low hanging, monkey faced, replight and mocked. If the translation was written by 1587, it coined many other words, such as separatist, insidiator, and virgin man. The translator also coined new meanings for 22 words, including mount, meaning to blush with rage or passion, and three Shakespeare plays coined three other meanings of mount, and rapture, meaning a strong emotional attack. And Coriolanus is cited as the first example of rapture, meaning a state of passion. The translation, the translation speaks of a monk feeling, quote, effeminate temptations toward a kneeling wench. The OED gives meaning three of effeminate as, quote, devoted to women. It states that, quote, unequivocal instances are rare, and it gives only two such examples, including one from the 1589 Art of English Poesy. We might add Henry IV's description of Prince Hal's low life in the taverns as, quote, wanton and effeminate, and Romeo's complaint that Juliet hath made me effeminate. De Cameron's story of Bertrand and Helena is well known to be a source for all's well that ends well. In his translation, Oxford emphasizes a parallel with his own life. The Italian version said, and I'm using English, of course, once the count, that is Bertrand's father, died, he, Bertrand, was left in the hands of the king, okay? But Oxford translates this as, quote, old count Isnar dying, young Bertrand fell as a ward to the king. Just as Oxford became the first royal ward in Elizabeth's new wardship system after his father died in 1562. Later in the story, the Italian version has the king say to Bertrand, quote, Beltramo, you are henceforth great and provided, close quote. Once more, Oxford's longer English translation introduces a key autobiographical word, quote, noble count, it is our royal pleasure to discharge your wardship. And this is the only instance of that phrase, discharge your wardship in Ebo. 
it is likely that Oxford thus drew attention to a pivotal parallel with his life, not only because he identified with Bertrand, but because he wished at least some readers of his manuscript translation would recognize this parallel. It would lead readers to understand further that Oxford identified with Bertrand's unwillingness to marry the woman he was ordered to marry. In another story, we find the phrase, quote, there shall we hear the sweet birds sing, recalling that phrase in the Rape of Lucrece, as well as where late the sweet birds sang in Sonnet 73, and the sweet birds, oh, how they sing in the winter's tale. The only other example of sweet birds sing in Ebo before 1620 is in an ignoto poem in England's Helicon. And many of us agree with Looney that ignoto was one of Oxford's pen names, further connecting the 1620 work with Oxford. In another tale, Philippa argues to the judge that she never refused to have sex with her husband, but her libido is stronger than his. So she asked the judge, quote, what should I do with the overplus remaining in mine own power and whereof he had no need to as being accused of adultery, need I add? Overplus here means excess libido. The OED gives the first use of this meaning of overplus as excess in Shakespeare's sonnet 135. Thou hast thy will and will to boot and will in overplus. Will meaning carnal appetite here. I'm almost done. In Oxford's private letters, he favored double vowels and words that were seldom spelled that way in his time. This translation also favors such spellings, including we, he, and she with double E's. It uses worthy with double O's, which is found in only three other works published in 1620, whereas worthy with one O is used 40 times as often. The 1565 to 16. 67 translation of Ovid's Metamorphoses, which I have attributed to Oxford, transformed the original Latin to a much longer and even more ribald English poem. Similarly, the 1620 translation is also longer than Boccaccio's original and more salacious than Salviati's Italian edition. And we might recall in this context Sir Sidney Lee's description that Oxford, quote, Oxford's, quote, guardian Cecil found Oxford's sense of humor a source of grave embarrassment. In conclusion, some of you may be skeptical that Oxford could possibly have written more than the Shakespeare canon. But don't forget Spain's Lope de Vega. He was 12 years younger than Oxford. Some 3,000 sonnets and 500 plays are attributed to him. 80 of his plays are considered masterpieces. So let's not sell Oxford short. To date, we have failed to give Oxford credit for the full range of his brilliant literary creativity. Thank you.